Author Media presents Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. This is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and change the world with writing worth talking about. I'm your host, Thomas Umstead Jr., and today we're going to talk with Mary DeMuth about guesting on podcasts. Uh, Mary DeMuth is the author of over 40 books, or around 40 books, including uh, the critically acclaimed We Too, and she's also a podcaster in her own right with over half a million downloads. Mary, welcome to The Novel Marketing Show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So how did you get started guesting on podcasts? Actually, let's back up a little bit more. What does it mean to guest on a podcast? Why is that even a good idea? Well, um, I've, I've been around the business a long, long time. And way back in the olden days, the PR person would book you on TV and radio. And that was really the only way other than being on maybe blog tours that you could get your message out to a wider audience other than, of course, writing an amazing book and having people talk about it. And uh, unfortunately, one of the things that I found during that time was that um, although TV was kind of fun to be on, it did not move the needle at all. And uh, I think it could be if you were... Um, there are some, obviously, sometimes where being on TV or on that kind of a platform would be helpful. But also um, the things that were more effective during that era was radio. And uh, we had to learn all sorts of techniques like, well, how do you get people to come to your website when you're on the radio? But in the past couple of years, I have noticed that really podcasting audiences are the folks who buy books. And to have an in-depth conversation with uh, a host or an expert has been one of my strategies of selling books because I believe in those niches of uh, podcasting audiences um, and the the need in those spaces to be authentic and vulnerable. Uh, the intersection of those two has been really um, a sweet spot for authors to talk about and help people uh, across that platform. And I do find that, uh, for instance, um, being on a large platform recently, uh, I got to see um, within a few hours, a couple hundred people following me on Instagram as a result. So there's just some really cool things that that help us along when we are on podcasts. Which is because you've been on CNN and mm -hmm. did you get hundreds of new subscribers after being on CNN you know, compared <laughs> no. to the podcast? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. And I think this is an important thing to underline because a lot of people think, man, if I could just get on TV, uh, that will just really drive book sales. But your point, I think, is very well taken that the kind of people who watch TV, especially nowadays, the people who are watching yeah. live television, they're not often the kind of people that read books. Not to say that none of them read books, but not every American reads books. And, you know, a lot of the people that you're talking to on television have bought their last book in 1995. <laughs> and they haven't purchased a book since then, or they haven't read a book since then. Whereas the kind of person who's choosing to listen to a podcast, right, to, choosing to listen to people talking about a topic for 30 minutes is the same kind of person with the patience and intellectual curiosity to want to read a book, whether it's fiction or or nonfiction. So it's what we would say, a target rich environment. <laughs> so it's it's not to say that uh, every podcast listener reads books either. Although I don't know if I personally know a podcast listener who's not also a book reader, either in audio or in paper form. And I will say in my experience, podcast audiences are the most eager for an audiobook. So uh, so if you're going to use like a podcast tour strategy, having an audiobook is really important because there is a percentage of podcast listeners, and I put myself in that group, that will only read the book if it's an audiobook. If your book is only on ebook and paper book, uh, we won't read it. In fact, there's a book that came out and I was so excited about it. It's not on audio yet. I bought it and it has been sitting mostly unread. I've been trying to read it <laughs> like on multiple occasions, trying to get through this really thick book and I haven't yet. And once it's on audio, I'll probably have it finished in a handful of days. And, and so there's a, that's a certain kind of buyer, but there's a far more buyers who buy in paper and ebook uh, that would only find out about your book if it's a podcast. So tell us a little bit about how you got started guesting on podcasts. How did you make that transition from radio and TV to podcasting? Well, I initially, I'm a traditionally published author mostly. And so um, 
couple of years ago when I started to have um, public relations people contact me about whichever book was coming up, I, I, I think just because I know you, Thomas, but I also instinctively believed that being on a podcast was going to matter. And so I started to kind of look around and I'm a podcast listener too. So, you know, just kind of writing down the the dream list of what I wanted and then um, doing some research more recently by a tool that I found through um, sponsoring this podcast, uh, being able to f- contact hosts about, uh, you know, getting on the show. And so I've had p- uh, PR folks do that for me, but I've also done it for myself. And um, it does take a bit of spreadsheet knowledge and, uh, and tenacity and, um, relationship. Uh, but I, I would say in the past two or three years, I've been on quite a few podcasts now. Of course, I have, I'm not as spreadsheety as you, Thomas, so I can't tell you the exact number, but I would guess it would be about 70 times or so. So that's a lot of podcast interviews and that's a lot of audiences that you're reaching, right? Because each podcast is its own kind of bubble of listeners. And sure, they overlap. But even when they overlap, I mean, imagine a listener who's heard you now on a third different podcast. In their mind, you are they've had your voice in their head for an hour plus at that point. That's a lot of influence. That's a lot of connection. Uh, and they're much more likely going to buy your book, you know, assuming you did a good job on the interview. But I imagine if after uh, a few dozen, you, you've got you've got it down at this point um, and, and it's re- really influential. So now what you're talking about is setting up a podcast tour, like you set up a tour for your um, most recent book. We too uh, talk. Talk to us a little bit about what it's like to set up a tour and what the experience is like having done it both where a PR firm did the tour for you and where you did the tour yourself or you both were setting up the tour together? Yes, this one, this most recent one, recent one was more of a hybrid. So I was doing a lot of the research on my own and then sending them the contacts. It, do, it does look more professional if a well-respected media firm contacts that podcast versus me as a rando guest. And so we, I kind of feel like it was the best of both worlds because I was able to get the research done and ask, okay, can you ask these ones? And then they had the leverage of their name to be able to, you know, also take care of all the housekeeping of it all. Thankfully, my PR firm also has uh, access to my Calendly and my um, my uh, Google Calendar as well. And so it all has become a pretty seamless activity. I think with this book, we've maybe had four, 30 or 40 different interviews. Um, so it has been very successful. And I think one of the things we need to remember is don't always go within your uh, comfortable niche, but to begin to think outside the box. I've been on a very wide variety of different types of leaning podcasts um, from far left to far right. And uh, that has actually been a real joy and a bonus because now I'm reaching the kind of audience I want to reach people I would never reach normally. I'm, I tend to be very centrist. Um, and it helps me to understand how to articulate my message better in less hostile and more hostile environments. Yeah, because podcasts are not gotcha journalism, right? Not not typically. Yeah, not typically. Uh, that was somewhat antagonistic, right? Like you were you knew they were maybe a little bit friendly with to you, but you're never quite sure, right? When you're on a television, you're being interviewed live. Uh, whereas with a podcast, there's this kind of courtship dance that happens before the interview happens, where you're exchanging emails and you're getting to know each other and you're checking each other out. And most interviews, and I, I would venture to guess all or almost all of the interviews you've done, all 70 have been cordial, right? It's not like, a, oh, how dare you, you know, kind of <laughs> people don't have enemies on their podcasts, generally speaking. And if they do, you know that coming in. Right. Um, I, I was invited on a podcast. I was a guest, sort of. The host invited me and somebody who disagreed with me on to his podcast to have a debate uh, on a topic. And for two hour, hour and a half, we had a debate, <laughs> like an honest to goodness debate. We didn't interrupt each other. Like I, it, was, it, it wasn't a formal debate like with stopwatches, but it was um, a very in in depth conversation over a topic in which we fundamentally disagreed. We didn't completely disagree. We found the areas that we agreed on, but uh, that I found is uh, much uh, less 
uh, common. Now, I, I want to go back because you mentioned a tool that I'm a big fan of, and I'd like you to explain how you use it. Calendly. And we'll have a link to this in the show notes. What is Calendly and how do you use it? It's a, I, I use the free portion of that. It's a um, scheduling software online that people can, you give them your specific link, like mine is calendly.com forward slash Mary dash Demuth. And uh, then people can go ahead and find your empty spaces and schedule something with you. It just takes away from, oh my goodness, the headache of podcasting, which is, can you do it on Thursday at three? No, I can't do it then. I have a dog appointment. <laughs> you know, no, how about first for Friday at two? No, that doesn't work either. How about next 40, you know, 40 days from now at four o'clock? No, I can't do it then. This just shows um, exactly what's available. And if you end up getting a Calendly link that isn't going to work after all, you can always just change it. So it just eliminates a lot of the back and forth that stresses me out in scheduling a podcast. Because you can give the same link to 10 different podcasts. And when the first podcast picks a time, it shows that time is being booked for all of the subsequent podcasts. Because this, this is the other challenge. Because it's not just about figuring out, are, are you free on Tuesday? But it's like, well, when I told you I was free on Tuesday, I was. But since then, somebody else has come in and it's chaos. And the temptation is like, oh, my gosh, I got to hire an assistant who will handle this for me. It's like, well, you could hire an assistant or you could use this free tool. And I'm such a big fan of Calendly. I've set it up. Uh, I have the paid version. So I have more than one calendar. So I have one for coffee. I have one for lunch. I have one for consultations. I have one for uh, different podcast interviews for my different podcasts. And then I have one for being a guest on other people's podcasts. And they all have different rules, right? So one of them, I'm like, this one doesn't book on Fridays. And they all look at my calendar. So if I put an event on my calendar, uh, let's say I'm at a meeting or something, it will show that time as being uh, not available across all of my different Calendly links. So I should probably become an affiliate with Calendly because I'm like I such an so. uh, advocate for them. I'll, I'll look into that. Maybe it'll have a, an affiliate link in the show notes by the time um, you see this. So you've set up your podcast tour and you've got, you know, during the launch window of your book, you've got dozens of uh, podcast interviews coming up. What are some things that you do uh, to prepare for that interview? Uh, so you do a good job on the interview itself. If it's something I'm familiar with, just to be honest, I don't do a lot of prep because if it's a, if it's a podcast I've listened to a lot, then I know exactly what to expect. If it's not, um, which has been a lot of the ones that I've had for the We Too book, um, I will sometimes listen to an episode. I certainly will go onto the page and see, you know, what kind of interaction they have. Um, if they have, if they're on iTunes, like how many reviews they've had, which is something you should also do before you book because you don't want to spread yourself out so thin that you're going to every, you know, randos podcast who has maybe four listeners. You want to be sure that, that they have some listeners, but I will, I will do that. And sometimes they'll, oftentimes they'll ask for a press release or a um, media kit, which I will give to them or my publicist will give to them, which has all the questions. So I already know going in, you know, what kind of questions we're going to talk about. Sometimes the host will send me a list of their own questions and that's really helpful too. I'll go through those before I jump on the air. And, uh, I also have all the right links that I've given to them, like what works on Skype and then I can be on Zencaster that I can be on my phone. I can do this. I can do that. Just giving them a variety of ways that they can connect with me, um, I think is also really helpful. That's really good. And I, I want to underline because you're like, oh, I don't do very much prep if I've already listened to the show. But listening to the show is perhaps the most important prep you can do. Yeah, uh, that's hugely important because if you've never listened to the show, it's really easy to be blindsided. I remember learning this uh, the hard way. I was doing a guest interview on some podcast and they had like this recurring segment of it, imagine yourself on your deathbed and if you could give yourself advice your past self advice and uh, this was like a segment that was on every episode and I was completely blindsided early I think I was completely blindsided by it and I was like oh my gosh you know it's like I should have listened to the show I should have known what kind of advice to give myself and I had to like come up with something on the spur of the moment um, but there, a lot of shows have elements like that and if you listen to the show you kind of get an idea of what to expect so you listen to the show ahead of time you you, you know you talk with them about what the questions are going to be ahead of time some shows give you the questions ahead of time some sh some shows don't uh, I will say as a host I go back and forth I used to always send questions ahead of time but I found that that made the conversation a little more stilted 
and it made it a little harder to change directions. And so I've been in the last few months experimenting with uh, not doing that or maybe only sending one question. Uh, you know, so if somebody has like five tips from a chapter of their book and, you know, there's five specifically, I may send them that question. So it's not like gotcha question because, you know, after somebody's read, written a dozen books, they may have forgotten all five of those tips from that one chapter they wrote. Uh, and I don't want to put them on the spot in that way. Um, but like, I haven't sent you the questions for this interview, right? We just jumped jumped into it. Um, and so that's one of the things as you do more interviews, you have to kind of be ready uh, for both ways. So, all right. So we talked about preparing. Now let's talk about the interview itself. What advice do you have for somebody who's going into their first interview or their second interview? How can they be a better guest? First thing I would say is think about this is just a conversation. Don't think about anything else. Take a deep breath and know that, uh, it's, it's not about, um, performing. It's about interacting and be yourself. Um, I definitely do not like listening to podcasts where it sounds fake or people are reading things and not, I mean, it's fine to read an introduction and all of that, but uh, I think that's important for authors. I would say re-familiarize yourself with your book. <laughs> um, I, this, uh, I forgot my questions on my, um, press release. And I mean, I knew that they were there, <laughs> but I was like, there was like, okay, um, there are seven misunderstandings that the church has about sexual abuse. Can you talk about number seven? I'm like, oh my gosh, what is number seven? And I'm like flipping through my book, you know, <laughs> trying to sound really chill and cool. I'm like, well, let me see here. <laughs> so just kind of, I, I, I walk through my book. I kind of thumb through it one more time before the interview starts. Just so I am familiar with my content. Like you said, um, this particular book is my 39th. And so I don't have pages memorized of things I've written. And I also make sure that I have my book with me at all times, because that does really help. When I first started doing radio interviews, what I did um, was this. I, I printed off all of the questions that um, were on the press release. And I also uh, answered them um, physically with, I typed in the answers and I put it in a three ring binder. And so whenever I was being interviewed, I had all of that access. I didn't read the answers, but I knew that I was never going to be caught off guard because I was brand new at it. And I uh, was nervous to be honest. And um, so this really gave me the kind of tool I needed to feel very comfortable behind the mic. Yeah, I find that the more interviews you do, the easier it is to kind of mail it in when it comes to preparation. Because you're like, oh, this is my, you know, one millionth interview. And I recently made that mistake. <laughs> I was on a podcast uh, as a guest recently. And I'm like, I haven't listened to I listened to a part of an episode, but I had not listened to a full episode. And I was really feeling that lack of preparation as as the interview continued. And I, I was kind of having to be ready for any kind of question from any direction because I had no idea. And I'm like, I hope you don't want deathbed <laughs> confessionals on this. Um, and so that's one of those things that's just, I think, a dis discipline of, you know, having a checklist or kind of having a, a routine that you do ahead of time. And I love the idea of putting together a binder where it, where you kind of do the preparation one time and you can reference back to it. Uh, what I do is I often have a document up on my screen and I'll jot down notes or thoughts um, during the interview. But I'll also have um, like the name of the show and the name of the host on the document so that I can use the host name because as a general rule, I'm terrible with names. And I, uh, one of my fears, and I don't know if I've ever done this, but getting a host name wrong yes. on an interview or the show's name wrong. Like it, it's, it's, it's a fear that I have of like being a rock star and being like, hello, Seattle, but it's really Portland, you know, like I'm not a rock star. I'll never be a rock star, but like that fear of saying the wrong name is, I don't know. I don't know how I, I picked up this fear, but I have it written down um, in front of me uh, just to um, help uh, put my fears at ease, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't want to have that nervousness going in. You want to feel like you're prepared enough and joyful and peaceful enough to, to tackle it. And that does really help. Yeah. So, okay. So now let's talk about what do you do after the interview? Are there any things that you do in terms of follow up or uh, promoting the podcast? Kind of walk us through that uh, procedure. If I were on my own, then I would definitely send an email afterwards and say, thanks so much for that 
interview and uh, really appreciated it and let me know how I can help you promote it. My publicist does that for me. So that is one little step I don't have to worry about. But what will happen is then I will eventually be contacted by the host or through the publicist and they'll say, Hey, it's happening on Thursday. Can you, here's the link, here's the art. And I try to, at least on one of my channels, promote it. Uh, because I feel like they have done so much work to have me on and blessed me by their platform that I can also choose to bless them with my platform. Yeah. And I think, and that's part of why podcasts have guests, right? They're hoping that the guests will grant, um, you know, some expansion of the audience and also some credibility uh, to the show, right? So it's always a good idea to say nice things about the show while you're on the show, or at least uh, avoid insulting the show like this podcast is terrible it's like yeah you know who disagrees with that literally everyone who's listening yeah exactly. <laughs> no one's forced to listen to a podcast so it, it's safe to assume that all of the listeners are, are going to be fans of the podcast already um all right so uh, what other advice do you have uh, for somebody who's wanting to start a podcast tour and they're not sure where to start well, the first thing I would say is that they should become a Patreon of novel marketing so they can amass themselves to the tool that you have for them because that is golden. Um, uh, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was kind of on the second wave of podcasting and uh, my publicist had kind of used all of their clout and all of their uh, avenues. And so I started just doing some more research myself and used that tool and was able just to send them, here's the podcast, here's the host, here's how to connect. And it was really, really helpful. And this has not been paid. Thomas didn't ask for this. <laughs> None of it. I just really, honestly, really love that tool. Thank you for that. Uh, I really appreciate that. And, and for those of you wondering, it's the podcast host directory and there's no tool like it. I, I sat down with a PR person and she's like, this has email addresses of podcasters that I can't get anywhere else. And there are tools for PR firms that are cost $10,000 plus uh, that don't have what the podcast host directory has. And it's limited to patrons. I'm going to give the pitch right now since you, you've set me up for it. It's limited uh, to patrons only, but we only have 100 slots uh, available uh, at this level because I am going to sell it for a lot more money, but I'm giving kind of the first 100 slots uh, to patrons. And we it's already half sold. I think I haven't looked at the numbers. We're actually just about to pass 100 total patrons, but uh, it has to be the $5 level and up. So there's still more openings than that. But uh, once it once it fills, it fills and I'll, uh, it'll still be available to, be, to buy, but it'll be a, a significantly more expensive. But uh, the podcast host directory gives you the email address of over 100,000 podcaster. So you just type in the name of the podcast, you type in the topic. So if your podcast is about golfing, you just type in the word golf, and it'll show you dozens and dozens of podcasts on golf, and then it gives you their websites and their email addresses, you can contact them. Um, what to do with that pitch is a topic for another day, <laughs> but uh, you at least have the email uh, so you then can do something with it. And it doesn't have and will not have, at least well, I don't plan on adding, CSV export, because I really believe that these need to be personal emails that you send to just one podcaster and you're not just cop carpet bombing a whole category of podcasts. I, I get those emails as a podcast host and I don't like them. I never have used them. To, I've never once booked. I used to have a, an interview podcast and I had never once used one of those kinds of blanket, impersonal, I don't even know what your podcast is about kind of emails. I just think a right to trash. Yeah. So what are some other things? Because you did you hosted a, a podcast for a long time. Um, so you've been on both sides of the microphone as well. What are some like pet peeves that your guests would do uh, that, you know, you wish they hadn't done? And you kind of this is your chance to spread the word and be like, hey, here's some things to avoid. Well, um, that's one reason why I stopped doing the Restory show is that for two or three years while doing it, I was personally vetting the people whose stories it was. And toward the end of the podcast, I had to kind of trust people about their stories because I didn't know everybody that was coming on. And there was a couple guests in particular that I, I, although I shared with them, this is about storytelling. This is about telling your story. I didn't know how to say it in any more clearly. And so when I got it on um, the interview, they just had like four word answers to my questions. And, and some of those I just 
I said, I can't air this because it's so uninteresting. <laughs> I didn't say that to them, but I just said, I'm not able to use this interview. And, and it's because they just simply didn't listen to the show and realize this is not about saying a bunch of pithy sayings. This is about telling your story and finding the lessons within the story, but not about didactics. And so, um, that was very frustrating to me. And then there were times where I felt used by, the author in particular, who they just want to be on my podcast to talk about their book, but they weren't willing to to really dive in deep and have a conversation and talk about their story, which I will, of course, talk about their book at the very end and it can come up. But I, I don't like the self-centered me, my, my, me, my book, my book, the kind of person you'd want to avoid at a party. I don't want them on my podcast. Yeah, I recently on my other podcast uh, had to not air an interview because the guest all the guest was doing was promoting uh, their uh, their stuff, and I'd ask a question and be like, "Well, to find out the answer to that, you have to buy my two thousand dollar course or come to my conference or whatever." And I'm like, "That that doesn't work." I was like, "I'm going to give you a chance to tell us about what you have here at the end, but you have to provide value, and it's not just a matter of like being kind and like." But it's also a matter of like building trust, right? Like somebody who's just met you on a podcast, they're not going to buy your thing. Like that's, that's, they're not ready for that proposal of marriage. <laughs> that's like telemarketing. Yeah. And, and that doesn't work. And so you have to really have a, a servant's mindset and know what the podcast is looking for. Cause not all podcasts want you to share a long story, right? Like what you were looking for is unique to your podcast. And if they had have listened to an episode of your podcast, be like, Oh, wow. Mary will let somebody talk for 10 minutes without interrupting them with a question. Like, cause I was a guest on your podcast and you just let me go. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is really different. Um, but I knew that that was what the expectation was and that you're wanting me to tell a story. And so that allowed me to kind of tell a story in a, grander arc than I would have been able to. And then I have, because I've told that story in other podcasts where they're wanting something faster, right? So I cut details and have to get kind of to the heart of the story. And, you know, the story has a one sentence version, a one paragraph version and a 10 minute long version. And so knowing which version of a story, you know, whether it's a story behind why you wrote your book or the summary of your, of your plot, if it's a novel, knowing what the podcaster is expecting uh, really helps you fit with that show and with the expectations of the listeners as well. Uh, because the listeners are listening to the show because they're liking the way the other shows have been, right? So if somebody's listening to Restory Show and they've listened to 50 people share their long stories and then somebody's giving one word answers, if you had aired that episode, the listeners wouldn't have liked it and they wouldn't have liked the guest because it didn't it violated their expectations in a, in a toxic way. So um, what are some other tools that you use for making uh, podcast tours easier? Well, definitely the Calendly thing and my Google Calendar and um, having a like overarching calendar. I'm also a paper person, so uh, I have it all written down on my weekly Moleskin, um, because I like to be able to cross things off and I don't feel the same satisfaction when it's just on my Google calendar. So I, that's redundant, but it works for me. Um, and I also have to understand my limitations as well. Like I think tomorrow I have two or three interviews right in a row. And I normally don't do that because my energy level wanes. And I have to understand too, that when I'm giving out like that, it's like a speaking engagement. And so whenever you are emoting and talking about, especially with we too, it's talking about sexual abuse in the church, not a light topic. I have to, I have to remember to give myself some space in between those interviews. I understand that in the launch window within that first month, there's going to be a lot of back to back stuff, but, um, if I can at all educate my PR person or remember myself <laughs> to give myself some space in between is helpful. And you can actually do that in Calendly. You can set Calendly to have a, a buffer. But I do know that having it set in Calendly and actually agreeing to it, because uh, sometimes uh, things are negotiated and shifted around, it makes that uh, difficult. But uh, before we go, do tell us about your book, We Too, because this is uh, a book that I, is very interesting, and I'm very glad you wrote it, and I want our listeners to know about it. <laughs> 
Yeah. So it's called We Too. And the subtitle is How the Church Can Respond Redemptively to the Sexual Abuse Crisis. It's a prophetic imagination for how we can be. And it is also letting us know where we are in terms of storytelling and talking about sexual abuse, even from the front of church and what has gone wrong and how can things be better for those who are broken by this particular issue? How can church leaders rise up and do something different instead of the status quo of how we've been doing things? And so it's it's a wake-up call, but it's not anti-church, it's pro-church, and um, which is a hard, weird little center dance that I'm, I'm doing because on the one hand, you've got these terrible stories of pain. And on the other hand, you've got the structure of a, in, an institution that it doesn't, doesn't move very quickly and doesn't change very rapidly. So you're wanting to be both pro-victim and pro-church. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird dance. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm pretty tired. It's a controversial place to be because you get shot at from both yes. sides. And uh, <laughs> I, I can I can appreciate that because I, I know what it's like to be shot at. I know from, you know this. <laughs> uh, both, <laughs> but both sides. But uh, real quickly, um, this episode is brought to you by a webinar, a free webinar that I'm hosting uh, later this week. It's about how to leverage the power of podcasting. So if you're intrigued by podcasting and you're wanting to learn more about how to use it, whether as a guest or a host, or even as a listener, I'll be talking about that in this free webinar. I'll also be answering your podcast related questions. And I'll have links uh, for that in the show notes. It's at 7 p.m. Central Time. And there's also a link to convert the time zone, which yeah. I will say Helpful. is another thing that Calendly yes. does. Well, this is like a free ad for Calendly. Uh, it also converts the time zones, which is really nice. And our patron today is uh, Driver Confessional by David L. Winters. It's about a Christian rideshare driver who lands in hot water with the Russian mob. Antonio and his cop brother must solve it before it is too late. And I want to say thank you to David Winters for being a patron. And thanks to all of you who are patrons uh, helping keep the show on the air. Uh, I, you know, I'm happy to give you uh, access to things like the podcast uh, host directory because I am so appreciative of the show wouldn't exist <laughs> if it wasn't for our patrons. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, supporting the show. And if you would like to become a patron, we have a link in the show notes. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for joining us today on the Novel Marketing Podcast. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Thomas. Do you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show? Call our listener helpline at 512-827-8377. You can also send us an mp3 at novelmarketing.com slash contact. If you don't like talking on the phone like me, you've been listening to Thomas Umstead Jr. and Mary DeMuth on the Novel Marketing Podcast, giving you innovative ideas on how to promote yourself and your writing offline, online, and everywhere in between. Thanks for listening.